My name is Heather Graham and I'm a Business Development Director with IC Research and it is my distinct pleasure to work with Sarah Zengler from Kraft Heinz and present to all of you uh, findings from some really exciting research that we did. Hello, thanks for um, allowing me to work with you on this project, Heather. Happy to be here presenting these results. This morning we'll be talking about inflation and the impact it is having or could have on consumers and on CPG FMCG firms like Kraft Heinz. And just as importantly, what we as marketers can do to get ahead of this latest crisis. We're all feeling the impacts of higher price points, whether we're in our consumer shoes or in our marketeer shoes. Sarah, can you start us off with giving a small window to how you and your team are addressing inflation and, and helping consumers to address the current situation? Sure, I, I think I should start off by just highlighting how drastic that this has actually become. So we'll first walk through that today and then we'll get into how consumers are actually reacting to the drastic price increases that we're seeing at shelf. And we'll end with how Kraft Heinz is actually responding to price increases and inflation. Uh, so as Heather mentioned, we've all noticed that our grocery prices are rising and it was quite quite eye opening for me to actually see these figures firsthand. Um, you don't have to work for a major manufacturer to catch on to these rising prices. It's definitely no longer a secret. So let's start by just taking a look at the early, um, how drastic this has become across all categories. Uh, so grocery prices are store soaring. Uh, if we take a look at some major categories across the store, meat is up 16% versus last year, milk is up 11%, and even coffee is up over 10%. Uh, within my platform at Kraft Heinz, we've taken an average price increase of 11% across our products. Overall, prices are expected to rise 6% across total food and bed, and consumers are spending 8% more on groceries versus this time last year. This is all happening with the government deciding to reduce spend on SNAP and other governmental programs that they were investing heavily in throughout the pandemic. So now these consumers have even less spend available to them at the grocery store. You don't have to be a low income consumer to start changing your behaviors. I myself, I'm considering stop, I, I may stop using Instacart because the fees are starting to pile up. I'm realizing that I could repurpose those fees to buy more staples for my household. So I'm going to start taking my toddler to the grocery store every weekend to save a little bit of money and put it back into food specifically. Uh, so we're all starting to make small changes to how we spend our money across food and bev. The combination of rising cost and packaging for manufacturers, ingredients, the labor shortages we're seeing, which is then delaying production in our plants, along with rising gas prices that make it harder and harder to transport the food and ingredients we need, are creating a perfect storm here, and we're feeling it when, we, when it comes to our food spend. These are some quotes from uh, leaders in major manufacturers, and you'll see that nearly every manufacturer in the U.S has taken price this year to, due to rising cost. Uh, basically, no category or product has been spared, uh, and we're going to see increases across the board. Our own CEO actually mentioned that we can't keep passing these costs on to consumers. Eventually, we're going to hit a point where we price everything out, and we need to start looking for more creative ways to address inflation for our consumers especially as we know that there's more price increases on the way, we're going to have to start thinking about increasing wages for plant and factory workers as the cost of living increases. So we really have not, uh, we were only at the, just at the beginning of this and there's more to come. My job at Kraft Heinz is actually to be an advocate for the consumer and make sure that they have a seat at the table in all, all of our conversations uh, and, and make sure that we're not increasing price unnecessarily for them. So let's talk a little bit about how consumers are reacting to these very drastic shifts we're seeing in price, how they're starting to change their behavior, how their perceptions are changing around grocery shopping. 
Uh, we know that consumers are resorting to cost-saving measures. As I mentioned, this is true for low-income consumers, middle-income consumers, high-income consumers. We're all adjusting in some way, shape, or form. And outside of putting a roof over our heads, groceries are actually the highest monthly spend among consumers. We spend about $450 per month on our groceries. Uh, and while we're probably seeing memes about gas prices and jokes around taking out loans for gas, in reality, consumers should actually be more concerned with what's happening at the grocery store uh, because we're seeing more significant increases there and more of our spend goes towards groceries. Not surprisingly, as you'll see at the bottom, private label has been a trusted alternative for most consumers. Uh, it's an easy swap uh, when they don't want to buy the name brand and they realize the cost has gone up. They're also cutting down on meat. Meat is a pretty expensive item at the grocery store. Uh, if they're not buying a veggie option instead or a carb option, they're opting for a less, less expensive protein. So maybe swapping from steak to chicken. Uh, and while I'm actually asking delivery fee, some consumers may actually start shopping online, maybe even picking up at store. Uh, to easily compare retailer prices and deals. So it's it's easy to bounce around from one retailer to another and pick the best products based on your deal. And maybe you can even stop by and pick up your groceries from two separate locations. Belt tightening measures are may include bulk buying as well. So buying larger packs in hopes that they're saving by buying in bulk. Uh, making a brand shift or a channel shift, so shopping maybe at a value or mass store versus a traditional grocery store, and just reprioritizing product attributes. So consumers are going to start really trying to think through what's truly important in the product they're purchasing, and are they paying for something that maybe they don't need. We've actually talked to some consumers firsthand as well um, and some very jarring quotes about the measures they're taking. So we're looking for items to sell around our house to prevent me from getting a second job. Or we're trying to use every last item in our fridge before we restock at the grocery store. It's really, it's, it's, it's hitting home hard in many cases and we need to keep our consumers in mind as we start to increase prices more. So lastly, I'd like to start talking about how, how Kraft Heinz is responding to this. Outside of just taking price, which is obvious, many major manufacturers are doing it across the board. We are trying to keep our consumer front and center. And as I mentioned earlier, it's my job to be the advocate for them. Uh, so while we have no choice but to raise prices, we're taking a few creative approaches to start thinking about how we can either prevent price increases, or be creative with how we talk to consumers about the value of our product. So there's four work streams that we've implemented across Kraft Heinz to lean into this inflation crisis. So we're gonna do a double click into each one. So the first one is showcasing our value beyond price. So certain brands at Kraft Heinz appeal to the value shopper more than others, such as mac and cheese or craft singles cheese slices and their primary benefit is affordability so when we take price obviously that benefit is no longer there or has definitely lessened uh, so we identified several benefits through using our demand landscape work across our brands that were positively correlated with affordability so we realized that it is affordability that's very important to these consumers, but there's also certain benefits that we can start highlighting that are also very important, such as warmth or sati satiation. Um, so for our especially vulnerable brands, we're requiring full-scale activation on communicating these benefits outside of affordability. Uh, we're also highlighting things such as versatility and explaining how they can use certain items in other dishes than what they're typically used to and stretching their pack of cheese further um, and, and thinking about it in a different way with how many lunches and dinners it can provide for a family of four, for example. Second, we're building consumer empathy. So we know that we're close to consumers on a daily basis, but not all of our cross-functional partners are. So we really don't want to lose sight of the humans behind these rising prices. So we're doing ethnos and you know, IDIs and online diaries 
to really bring them to life. Uh, those were the quotes I shared on the previous slide about selling things around the house and using every last item in the fridge. And we're sharing that across the organization uh, so we can keep that in mind when we start to think about adding ingredients that may cost more um, and realizing that our job right now is to try to keep prices down as much as possible. We're also trying to understand from consumers the trade-offs they're starting to make. So we can keep that in mind as they move from one category or brand to another uh, and how we can stop that from happening so they stay devoted to our brands. And then third, which is probably the work stream I'm most excited about, is we prioritize brand design to value sprints across our organization. And in a nutshell, what this really consists of is making sure that our brand is the optimal value to consumers. So it's a cost out exercise, but it's putting the consumer front and center. So what we're doing is we're adding value and highlighting what we know is very important to consumers and rationalizing all else. So we're taking out what we know consumers don't need, and this will create significant cost savings within the next few years. And finally, we're offering support where we can. So there are simple measures we can take to help consumers realize the value of our products. So we're doing simple math for them. So like I mentioned, this pack of cheese and bread will get you four lunches for a family of four or how much savings we can bring um, by creating a large dinner or lunch and having leftovers versus eating out at QSR. We actually have a lot of products that compete with convenient QSR products. So starting to highlight how much you can save by eating at home. We're also carefully considering our innovation pipelines. So perhaps we need to focus more on smaller packs for smaller households that are especially worried about food going to waste now and wasting money on that food um, and opportunities in price pack architecture for low income consumers. Uh, so we may have to put some of our, you know, breakthrough innovation items on hold and focus more on the items that will really benefit consumers during these trying times. And one advantage we have at Craft Times is we have a really large portfolio of products. So um, I'm hoping in some ways that some of our brands that can handle price increases uh, can take a hit for another product that we know definitely can't based on the consumers it serves. Um, so I'd like to hand it over to Heather now to talk more about the custom research they did on price inflation and its impact on shelf. Thanks, Sarah. So what are some things we should expect when it comes to shifting buying behavior? Well, IC used the last three weeks or so to run some re consumer research in the US to help provide some guidance. Though it should be noted it's early days yet, relatively speaking. So we don't, uh, we and the rest of consumers in the US haven't fully leaned into tighten belts and all, but we, we should be able to provide a glimpse as to what we might be able to expect. So our first market, for this research is the US, soon to be expanded to other countries around the world. We took two separate samples, running one through a virtual shopping exercise, followed by a brief survey to diagnose some of the behavior and understand some of the shoppers' perspectives on the current state of affairs. And then the other sample completed a conjoint exercise so we could get some of the nuances of things, followed by the, the same survey. We focused on four categories for this research, two that are lower frequency of purchase, body wash, dishwashing detergent, and two that are higher, bacon and chips. The virtual shopping sample were split into multiple cells with scenarios, um, some playing with price point and others playing with volume. So we have the current situation. We have a situation where a third of the products on the shelf were increased, uh, took price increases by 25%. We have a scenario where all of the products increased price by 25% and a scenario where a third of the products had volume decreased by 20% and then a final scenario where all of the products had volume decreases by 20%. In terms of the, the conjoint scenario, this is where we were able to get a little bit more nuances. We focused on the top 10 best-selling SKUs from the virtual shopping, so we ran these consecutively. We had uh, scenarios where we looked at both the current size as well as the 20% decreased volume uh, pack options. 
And then all of these were tested on six product levels, current, plus 5%, plus 10%, plus 15%, plus 20, plus 25. So we can sort of get an idea of the, the curve um, between current and the 25% that we tested for the, the virtual shopping exercise. So in terms of the, the pricing changes, um, when a third of the prices increase, the, the most price sensitive in our sample actually walked away from the shelf. Um, so we've, we've got some market share value decreases as we, as we go through this. But when everyone takes the price increase at a category level, penetration remains the same, right? It's, it's pretty close to status quo when everybody is increasing the price. But when I'm able to do some price comparison, um, I, I may make some different decisions as, as I'm looking at these various different categories. Again, remember that it's early days and also remember we sort of took an extreme when we went through this, this virtual shopping exercise with the, the 25% increase. When the um, prices change, consumers behave differently depending on the category, as, as you might expect. Lower frequency products, what we're looking at on the, the left side of this slide, they opt for a smaller package within the same brand more often. Um, so rather than necessarily shifting to private label, they're just dropping to a smaller pack size. If we're looking at high frequency products on the right side of this slide, what tends to be happening, and particularly for chips, is I've taken my first choice and spread that across something different altogether. It might be a different flavor, it might be a different brand, all of those things. I'm not taking a smaller pack, I'm making a completely different choice at the, at the shelf and exploring different brands. If we dig into body wash in particular, and the body wash example, um, if we just flick back and forth between these two slides, you'll see the top bar is the big pack of the best-selling brand. The middle bar is a smaller pack of the best-selling brand and then private label. And as we bounce back and forth, you'll see private labels not changing. Where we're seeing the changes is almost a one for one uh, swap to smaller packs within the, the same brand. And so we we're seeing some loyalty from a brand perspective, but also an insight to smaller pack choices are, um, you know, a, a new pack size can be a choice. If we're looking at the high frequency categories instead, chips in particular, what we're seeing is a few different things. There's a lot of variety on this shelf, right? If you've gone down the chip aisle recently, you can see it just goes on for miles and miles and miles. And when we increase the price by for a third of the category, we're seeing the, the leading brand go from a 31% penetration to 26%, a significant decrease within what we what we see when everyone takes a price increase you know we've got a little bit of a shift but not not really anything to write home about if we dig a little bit deeper to the bottom part of this slide when we look at one particular SKU, the highest selling SKU, um, it was a big pack it goes from 15 percent to 11 percent when a third of the the shelf increased the prices and this SKU took that price increase so it it hits home really hard. That being said, chips are an interesting thing. There's a lot of choice. They tend to be quite line priced. And so when you see something a bit out of the ordinary, it might trigger um, you to explore the rest of the shelf a little bit differently. And so there's a few of those things that we think are, are going on. So we've dug into price increase a little bit. Let's take a look at what happens with volume decreases. Well, overall, it's risky. And don't forget, again, we went to an extreme 20%. I would assume that most of the folks listening to this would do something smaller, not quite so, so extreme. When the volumes across the whole category uh, decrease at the same time, by some miracle, if all of them did it at the same time, there's less risk, like what we saw for the, the price increases. Or in a category like dishwashing detergent, that's it, if it's not really possible to compare, right? If we're talking about pods that are, I don't know, 43 and 67 and 62 and 58, there's not an easy way to really compare those. Um, there's there's such variation, it's, it makes it hard to understand what's going on in terms of the, the volume decreases. 
So these are two, two situations from a volume decrease perspective that it might be OK to go about that um, with the extreme that we tested here. But Sarah, for example, I can't imagine that craft singles could get away with dropping their SKUs to 13 or 14 slices from 16 unless private label also dropped their pack count because that's something that would be quite noticeable. And you might be wondering, OK, Heather, you, you talked about body wash, you talked about detergent, you talked about chips. You did say bacon somewhere in there. <laughs> I want to know about the bacon. Well, interestingly enough about bacon, um, we saw much less price sensitivity. We saw much less volume sensitivity. We saw much more brand loyalty. Um, there's a few reasons for this, we think. One is that bacon has steadily increased its prices and decreased its pack sizes over the years. And so consumers are used to the fluctuations uh, from one aspect and from another aspect, the most price sensitive of, of folks have already left this category. And so we think there's there's those kind of things going on, but at least from this aspect, for the moment, Americans are quite loyal to their bacon and making sure that they they are able to uh, continue to get their bacon and, and have that be as part of their cart. So in terms of, of some final thoughts, as we saw here, think about smaller pack sizes within your portfolio. You may not have them yet, we would suggest you consider adding them. Um, that being said, we're not saying walk away from the larger pack sizes. It may just mean rearranging your portfolio a little bit so that the emphasis is on the medium pack sizes, if you will, and less so on the larger quote unquote value pack sizes. Make sure that you have those and are framing or anchoring the choices so that you've got larger and smaller as well as medium pack sizes available for folks to make choices from so that they they feel like they've got some control over the choices that they're making at at shelf that being said large large packs may be a risk for the the near future the other thing that we saw here is um, we should take volume decreases with caution my own two cents is consider reducing the packaging and sarah sort of uh, mentioned this as she was talking through the the options to consider putting consumers at the forefront. What can we take out of the packaging that may not be necessary from a consumer perspective or a priority from a consumer perspective? There's a there's three wins we can take from that. One, it's a cost out. Two, we're not changing the 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 price or the volume on consumers, and so there's there's nothing that they're losing necessarily from a product standpoint. And three, we might be able to talk about some environmentally friendly packaging claims, which is while inflation is something that is top of mind, uh, environmental and eco friendly packing and products are things that are still at the forefront of many consumers um, perspectives. Sarah, final thoughts from you. Yes, Heather, I agree with all of your final thoughts, and I'm going to reiterate that them with some of the measures we're taking at craft. So we really need to start getting ahead and start having conversations around, around what can be rationalized within our products uh, because we may need to have those conversations now to actually be able to implement those changes within the coming year. Uh, so we owe it to our consumers to start removing what doesn't matter to them. It's a win for them, a win for us. As you mentioned, Heather, sometimes it's a sustainability win as well. Maybe they don't need a resealable pack uh, and we can remove it and save 30 cents per item. Uh, I think many of you would actually be surprised to hear what does truly matter to consumers and what doesn't. Uh, in some cases, this isn't a, a conversation we have with consumers even on an annual basis. So we need to refresh our thinking. And this is where your cost out exercises should start with the consumer front and center. Uh, it was It's not just about a max diff to understand all of the attributes that are important and the ranking of those. But when you start engaging with your cross-functional partners and their expertise, you can come up with really creative ways to lower your costs. So they have access to ingredient suppliers and packaging suppliers, and they may have started to think through things that the consumers aren't even aware of yet. Um, and I think this is, that's essential during this recession is getting ahead of the game so we don't have to take a price increase every few months. Thanks, Sarah, for those final thoughts, and thank you very much for working with us on this presentation. It's been a lot of fun, and I, I look forward to being able to do that with you again. Thanks, everyone, for listening, 
and please do reach out. Our email address is on the screen with questions for either Sarah or IC, and we'll we'll field them and forward them along as um, as makes sense.